Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming here today. My name is Brian Anquist. I'm the teacher training department manager for Spain and Portugal, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this first in a series of three free webinars that Pearson Spain is offering for primary teachers of English, empowering primary learners for the future. Now, tomorrow we'll be joined by Pearson teacher trainer for Spain, Michael Brand. He'll be speaking about how to develop the four C's of communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking in our young learners. And on Thursday, Elena Marino, our teacher trainer based in Barcelona, will be speaking about why and how games can form such an integral part of the learning process. And she'll also be giving some tips on how to build them into our classes for maximum effect. But today we're joined by Sarah Davila, who will be speaking about one of the most fundamental concepts that all teachers need to be aware of, and that's scaffolding, or basically giving your students the support they need as you take them further in their learning. Now, Sarah comes to us with a considerable amount of experience. She is a teacher, a materials writer, a researcher, and a teacher trainer, uh, and she's worked in a variety of contexts. Uh, she's also learning, uh, a learning expert at Pearson Education, a world learning SIT TESOL trainer, and an English language specialist at the U.S. Department of State. Sarah's based in the United States, but today she is on the road in Canada, so she'll be coming to us from Canada today. Sarah, thank you very much for being here, and uh, I think we're all really looking forward to your webinar today. All right. It is my pleasure to be here with everyone today. <clears throat> uh, of course. Uh, just before we get uh, before we get started, I'd like you to familiarize yourself a bit with our GoToWebinar platform. If you look in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you should see the GoToWebinar panel, or you'll see an orange arrow. If you don't see the GoToWebinar panel, you can click on that arrow, and that will expand the panel for you. Inside of the panel, I'd like you to scroll down and look for a section that is called Questions. In the questions section, you'll be able to type in uh, information. Uh, for example, you can tell us, uh, say hello, and let us know where you're calling in from today or where you're joining our webinar from today. So if everyone can take a moment to find that question box, again, this should be on the right-hand side of your screen in the drop-down panel in the section called questions. You'll see your cursor blinking, and that's where you can enter your information so that you can say hello in the chat today. Um, so let's see, I have uh, David uh, Davia calling in from Lithuania, Irina from Ukraine, Sharman from Switzerland, hello, uh, Maja from Spain, excellent, Laura from Portugal, Patricia calling in from Spain, uh, Elena, another, uh, who is that, Helena from Portugal, hello, Helena from Russia, Helen from Russia, <laughs> uh, all right, Zorana from Serbia, hello Serbia, nice to see you, Latvia, I see you in there, who is that from Latvia, uh, Svetlana, nice to see you, Diane calling in from Spain and Russia, great, I see Victoria from Ukraine, all right, Belarus, all right, Julia, call, Julia calling in from Belarus, I don't know if there's anyone else in here from Belarus today, I see lots of people from the Ukraine and Russia, great, Evelyn from Lima, Peru. I love Lima. That's one of my favorite cities to visit. So nice. Catalonia. Um, Alejandro from Catalonia. Mirla from Bosnia. Excellent. So again, if you haven't taken, uh, take a moment to find that chat box on the edge of your screen. Um, it is the question box. I apologize. The question box on your edge of your screen. Um, you can type questions into the question box. Uh, Brian will be monitoring that box and will collect questions to uh, answer at the end of our session today. Uh, also, we will be having a few Q&A activities in our session today, and we will use the question box to participate into those different questions. As you can see, I can see your names, and I'll, I'll call people out as we go through. Uh, when the answers are very quick, sometimes I might miss people, uh, but I do my best to, to Send a shout out when I notice somebody in there. Uh, so do feel free to communicate through that chat box today, uh, in the question box today. And with that, we'll go again ahead and get started. Uh, so today we are talking about scaffolding, and this really is about understanding how to give our students the support that they need in the classroom. <clears throat> 
Uh, to start off with this, I like to ask the question, what is scaffolding? So I'd like you to take a moment and think back to that time uh, when you were a younger person, a teenager, uh, learning how to drive a car. And perhaps you had an experience where you went out into a very large open space or to an old road that not a whole lot of people used. You may have been with your mother or your father or possibly a close family friend. Um, and you were in that car for the first time. Possibly you were a bit nervous, you were a little afraid the first time sitting behind that big steering wheel, trying to find all of those different buttons and knobs and figure out how this works uh, with someone trying to guide you through that process. And you know that you were in a space where you could make mistakes, nobody was get, would get hurt, there was plenty of open room and room around you in order for you to have that experience. Slowly, of course, as you got more comfortable working with that car and uh, driving, you started to drive down short roads. Uh, maybe you were driving to the end of the block and back. Maybe you were doing a short trip to the grocery store, uh, taking others outside of the car. All of these little bits and experiences until you felt a bit more comfortable, until finally you could drive freely without any assistance from a parent or from a friend or any other kind of support. You were simply able to drive that car by yourself. I like I like to use uh, driving a car because this is a great experience many of us have had and it's a wonderful example of how we tend to use scaffolding to achieve fluency inside of our classroom. So when we learn to drive that car, we first start off in a very open space where we know we're safe to make mistakes. It's very important. We know that we're about to learn a very difficult task and we take a lot of time practicing and going through the various different steps and stages to make sure that we're comfortable with the, the basics of driving a car before we move on. As we become more proficient, we start to take those short trips. We have a bit more freedom and autonomy. Maybe we're choosing where to go. We understand how to use the different aspects of our car until we do have that freedom uh, to move forward. And when it comes to English language learning, the process of scaffolding in the classroom is very similar. We start off with our students and giving them a lot of space to make mistakes, to learn new language, to learn new grammatical forms, to learn all of the new content that comes with the course that we're working with and the program that we're teaching towards. As our students become more comfortable and more fluent with the language that we're working with, they're capable of maneuvering themselves and driving their own English language journey, using that language in new and flexible ways until finally they can really drive freely with that language without any difficulty or without requiring extra assistance from us as the teacher. So when we think about scaffolding in the English language classroom, we can think about it in very much the same terms as driving a car. Because scaffolding is all about providing support to help our learners achieve success. To do this, it's really useful to know when to scaffold content in the classroom. So I'm going to use a model class today, and I've taken some time to understand what it is that will be easy and what it is that will be difficult for my students, and we'll use that example as we work through our content today. What I want to look at is when do I need to help my students and when do I need to take that support away. So scaffolding is essentially a synonym for support. And what I want to do is make sure that as my students are learning, I'm not giving as much support as I was giving in the beginning. I don't want to over scaffold because I want my students to be able to do this without my help. Just like driving that car to the end of the block, I want to stand and watch rather than having to be inside of the car with them. So to do this, I, I need to think about when I want to support my learner. And I'm going to, this is a, a question I know the answer, but I want you to see if you can guess. I have already looked at my lesson today, and I want you to think about which of these is going to be the most difficult for the students I'm working with. Will it be describing someone's physical appearance in a basic way guided by questions or prompts? Is it knowing and using the words beard, blonde? straight hair, spiky hair, cute, or good looking? Or is it using the verb be in the simple present with adjectives? So what do you think? I'd like you to take a moment, find that chat box, and then if you can type in an answer there. Let me see. I think, Arena, I think you were the first one in today. Very nicely done. Laura thinks it might be those verbs. That's always challenging with our grammar there. Evelyn and Amanda, I see your answer. Natalia, Nero, nice to see you there. Inez coming in with an answer. 
Raquel thinks it might be C. Laurel says maybe B. All right, could be those verbs. Grammar can always be a little bit challenging. Yanelle says for her students, it would be the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's always a good consideration. We're thinking about what can be the most difficult for our own students. And I'll tell you what's the most difficult for my students in the lesson today. Uh, Mariana says it could be the vocabulary. Diane agrees, also vocabulary, all right. Production, always a challenge. And we'll address how we can get to that today. All right, I'm seeing a couple of more vocabulary and grammars. Lots of Bs here, a couple of Cs, and that's that's a pretty normal spread. Um, generally, when we're planning for English language learning, we do anticipate that our students are going to have some difficulty with the grammar and vocabulary that we're introducing inside of the classroom. For my particular students that we'll be looking at today, they are going to struggle the most with the vocabulary. So for the A option, describing someone's physical appearance in a basic way, when guided by questions, this is something that my students can do. They will be able to use questions to describe appearance. What they won't be able to do without my help is use this different vocabulary, beard, blonde, straight hair, spiky, uh, cute, good looking, etc. cetera. Um, for the verb to be, I assume in this lesson that I have taught this to my students before. So the real difficulty for my particular students is going to be that B activity. And this is a way that you can think about what will be easy and difficult in your own classroom. Thinking about what you've previously reviewed with your students, what you know that they can do, this will help you understand their level of difficulty. And I saw several teachers comment that um, I know, for example, Diane Mack said vocabulary will be difficult for her students. Um, Yanelli Yen knows her students and she knows that vocabulary is going to be something difficult. So we can also use our instincts to understand what will be really challenging for our learners. It can also help to have insight into the level of difficulty. So is this going to be easy vocabulary, an easy skill, or easy grammar for my students? And to understand why this is important, when I understand what the most difficult part of my lesson is, then I can plan to balance that content appropriately. So you can see in today's lesson, I have very difficult vocabulary. My grammar then is going to be easier. That to be verb that I'm going to use is very simple. And the skill I'm using is really asking questions and answering questions about physical appearance. Those things will be easy for my students, but the vocabulary is difficult. So for scaffolding, I want to make sure for my vocabulary, I'm giving more clarification, I'm giving more practice, and I'm giving more support. And this is going to help my learners achieve success. Now, in my classroom, there are two different ways that I can determine what's going to be the most difficult. First is my own knowledge and understanding of what my students can do that can help me with that identification. And then the second is I can use some different tools in the classroom to understand scaffolding. Um, in this particular instance, I use the CEFR and Global Scale of English tool. I know that most of the students in my class are between an A1 and an A2. And when I looked up the vocabulary in the Global Scale of English for this lesson, I found that most of my vocabulary was an A2, A2 plus. That tells me that this will be the challenging content for my lesson. Uh, as many of us know from teaching language, we do want to challenge our students in order to make sure that our students will be able to make progress. So the challenge is not the problem, it's just that now that I know this will be challenging, I want to be sure that I can support my students for their own success. If you're interested in more information about this global scale of English, I will come back to this at the end of the session and we'll have some time for that. So now we want to think about how can I plan for scaffolding to make sure that my students will be successful inside of their lesson. With that in mind, I'm going to ask my second question. So go ahead and find that question box and get ready to answer. And here's my question. When you're beginning to plan for scaffolding, uh, what is the where is the place that you want to start? So where is the best place to begin when you plan for scaffolding? Is it the pictures and visuals from the book? the type of activities that you want to use in the lesson, the student's personal interests, or the end goal of the lesson. What do you think? Let's take a moment and type our answers into the chat. Diane Max in there with the end goal. Xenia says it uh, could be interest. Great. Alexander is looking at a combination of interest and the end goal. While you're typing answers, I, it's a bit dry in my room, so I'm going to be drinking a little bit of water throughout the session, so I apologize in advance. 
Yeah, and really says the end goal of that lesson there. Okay. <clears throat> Bagona starts with the student interest. Excellent. Thank you, Evelyn. It's always hard when we do these sometimes. Always hard to teach me, and you always need something to drink, coffee or water. It's my go-to. Uh, let's see. Sherman says what you're going to achieve at the end. All right. I like Alejandro coming in there with A and C, that those are linked together. Great. These are some great answers here. Um, so when I'm thinking about scaffolding, really what I want to look at um, specifically for an, an, in today's session is going to be the end goal of our lesson. <clears throat> the pictures and visuals from the book, if that's going to be something that's new and challenging for my students, that could be a consideration. Um, but really, and the types of activities, we do have the ability to adjust those. Student interest, we can also adjust to that as well. Typically, when I'm planning for scaffolding, I'm really looking at what is it I want to achieve by the time I finish my lesson. So the end goal here is actually quite important for me to make sure that I'm achieving student success. And to do this, I want to think about the objective and the content of the lesson and what will be the most difficult for my students. So again, in today's lesson, I've already identified the vocabulary will be the most difficult. So now I need to think about my objective and how I'm going to achieve that with my students. All right. So to do this, <clears throat> I'm looking at the things I know my students know and what my students do not know. I know that my students know how to ask and answer questions, and I know that my students know basic body parts, so they can just say face or eyes. They know ears and hair, lips, arms, legs, belly. They can use these words of basic physical body pieces, so what I, what I, body parts, so what I'm looking for now is can they actually do this with these different vocabulary words, which I'm presenting and I know that are new to the students. So with that in mind, <clears throat> I begin to construct my overall goal or my objective of my lesson. Um, I always like to tell, tell when I will see my students achieve the objective. So here it's by the end of the lesson. Um, that's where I'm going to know my students have completed our objective successfully. I want to know what they'll be able to do. So here my students will be able to describe someone's physical appearance. That's very important. We're going to be using the target language, that's the vocabulary of physical appearance, so blonde, straight, bald, good looking, handsome, that's our target language. And there will be guided by questions, so there is some support here for my students because they are A A1, A2 students, so they do still need that um, general guidance and support when they're working with asking and answering questions. So when I put all of this together, I now have the end goal of my lesson that I'm going to be teaching towards, and this is what I want to see students achieve success in by the end of the lesson. So uh, to understand again how difficulty worked, to get this difficulty, I looked at the vocabulary in the global scale of English, and you can see the vocabulary here is between an A1 and an A2+. Plus. Then I looked at the skill, and the skill here, describing someone's physical appearance while guided by questions, that's my skill. This is at an A1. When I combine this together, the overall difficulty of my objective is going to be about an A2 on the CEFR, um, and so this is information I can use to plan. Now that I know what my objective is, I can begin to plan to achieve that success. Now, for the lesson that I'm going to work with today, I want to think specific. For the lesson that I'm going to plan today, I want to think specifically about how I'm going to get to that object objective. I want to be sure that I'm introducing my difficult content, which in this lesson is going to be the vocabulary. From there, I want to work on practicing, practicing practicing, more practicing, lots of practicing. We definitely want to make sure that we're practicing that content. Um, this is all building towards successful fluency of my learner. Just like driving a car, before you actually get onto your first highway, you probably drove around that parking lot 15, 20, maybe even 30 times um, with your mother or father in the driver's seat. And the first time you started driving down those roads, uh, the short city streets, we would do that several dozen times before we actually did our first highway drive. So there's lots and lots of practice before we build up to that successful scaffolding um, to get to fluency to drive away. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask question number three. I'm about to show you two lesson plans. And what I'd like you to do is take a look at these lesson plans and tell me which one has the best scaffolding. 
So I'm going to show these on the screen for you right now. And we have lesson A is on the left side of your screen. Lesson B is on the right side of your screen. I'd like you to take a moment, read through the lessons, and tell me which one has the best scaffolding. And feel free to share with me why. Why do you think this is the best scaffolding? Um, I always like to hear your opinions and your ideas about this, and it's useful for others to learn from. Uh, so feel free to tell us why you think A or B has better scaffolding. Um, or if you have additional opinions you'd like to share, now is a great time to do that. And I see Amanda, you are first in there with an answer. Um, again, feel free to head back in and tell us about why. <clears throat> I see um, Lotgo is saying that uh, B is a bit more vocabulary oriented. <clears throat> Diane says that uh, B goes from, where did that go? B goes from small to big skills, yes. Amanda uh, came back and told us about introducing difficult vocabulary and building to skills in B. <clears throat> Charmin, is, lesson eight, it gets students interested and that is important, I agree. We do want to think about student interest and how we can engage them. Laura has a good comment here. A does have a lot of kinesthetic activities that can be very useful to our students. And so we're, let's see what are some of the answers here. Aminia says B is specific. Inya says B has more guided practice. Jose, I think that's a really good observation, Jose. Um, a has a lot of activities to practice and improve the knowledge of vocabulary. Um, and we, again, thinking about our end goal, how are we getting towards that? All right, Bego says there's a more use of vocabulary in real context. Students get engaged, excellent. So I see some great answers here going to take a moment to review together. Um, if you said lesson B, you are correct. Lesson B does demonstrate the best scaffolding of these two different lesson plans that we're looking at today. If we look at how the lesson is constructed, we're starting off with the introduction of the vocabulary and the with the definition, which is a presentation of our vocabulary. Uh, from here, we move to our first clarification activity, which is to practice the vocabulary by matching a word to a picture. And we use this to clarify students' knowledge and make sure that they understand the words and the meanings that are associated with those words. From here, we have our students do a short listening activity to choose the picture. This is some additional clarification to just make sure that all of us are understanding that vocabulary and making those connections to the meaning. <clears throat> Uh, from here, I have my students use that vocabulary in a dialogue to describe people or pictures. So now we're starting to get into use. Uh, again, remember, describing pictures and describing physical characteristics of people is part of my end goal. Next, we describe classmates using the vocabulary. Again, we're moving towards our end goal here of being able to describe the physical attributes of different people. And then finally, I have my students describing the physical um, attributes of different family members using the vocabulary. So as I move through lesson B today, my students are slowly moving um, from the introduction and clarification of the vocabulary through use practice, use practice, and finally using that language with some fluency. Now, lesson A is a very different type of lesson. It starts off with talking about family appearances. This is an activate schema or a prior knowledge activity, an excellent activity to make sure um, that my students have context for our lesson today. And I follow this with a word definition activity. This is very much a clarification activity. <clears throat> uh, from here, we go to writing sentences with words. So what's happened is we've gone from clarification, I, this is a use activity, but my students aren't speaking with the words, they're writing with the words. And remember, my end goal for my lesson today is that students will be able to use that vocabulary in a question and answer activity. My writing sentences is followed by crossword puzzles and then a bingo game. Again, both of these are excellent activities, but they are both clarification activities. So this is really clarifying the meaning of the vocabulary. 
This is followed by a toss ball with a say vocab. Again, this is a clarification of my vocabulary. Um, this is not really practicing the use of that word or how to use that to describe people in the room. And then finally, we come back to writing sentences about classmates. So while this is an interesting lesson and it's really going to focus on clarifying those vocabulary words, it's not helping my students get towards the use of those vocabulary words. And that's really what I want to be able to achieve by the end of my lesson today. Now, this is not a judgment of the clarification activities in A, crossword puzzles, bingos, um, I love the toss ball category activity. Those are all fantastic clarification activities, but they're not leading up to my final goal. Um, I could easily use a crossword instead of my practice vocab with a picture or even a bingo there to achieve the same results, but then I'd still want to build towards slowly using that vocabulary inside of my lesson. And before we move on, just a really quick, I want to check in. Are there uh, any quick questions before we move on to the next uh, set of activities? Sir, I don't know if there were a lot of questions. I did see a couple of things that came through. Um, some people were talking about uh, looking at the end, uh, where, you, where, where you're going with your lesson and talking about the idea of sort of back planning, which I think a lot mm -hmm. of people a lot of teachers think in those terms, which I thought was quite interesting. And also someone bringing up this idea of going sort of like from um, from guided to freer practice that they, they picked up on as well, which I think um, I think you'll probably be speaking about a little bit uh, later on in the webinar as well. <clears throat> I will. Excellent. And somebody's uh, kind of caught on to a little bit of backwards planning, which is one of my favorite ways to get to scaffolding in my lesson. Um, you are correct. We are carefully building our activities and making sure each of those activities is connected and that they're building towards our end objective with the scaffolding to promote fluent use of that language. So in today's scaffolded lesson, I want my students to be able to describe physical appearances without any support from me. So I'm slowly going to take support away as we get towards that end goal. I know that vocabulary is challenging, but I'm not going to make the vocabulary easier. I want the vocabulary to challenge my students so that my students can make progress. My goal is to give the students the support they need to use that vocabulary successfully. Oh. Um, and as you can see here, this is really how I'm building out my well scaffolded lesson plan. Um, I'm starting off with the presentation of the information and the content in my lesson, which is going to be my vocabulary. I do some clarification to make sure that my students can understand those new words. And then we do some controlled practice. We might do two or three controlled practice activities, depending on the time. Then I'll move into some freer practice where my students now are going to use that activity without so much control. And finally, into productive fluent use. Uh, for those of you, so you may have caught on that this is something we use a lot when we're working with young learners. And it's that present, practice, and produce, or the three Ps, the PPP lesson plan format. This is an excellent format for young learners where I'm working towards a productive use activity in my classroom. So with that in mind, we're going to try this. You're going to be my group of students, and we're just going to do a bit of a mini lesson here. Um, so I want you to play along in the chat box as if you're my students, and we're going to go through some of these activities, and let's see if I can get towards uh, my goal by the end of my lesson. <clears throat> so we're going to start off. I have some pictures on the board here. There's These may be some people that you recognize that you see. And what I want to do, I'm opening up the chat so I can uh, see your answer here. The question box is our chat room. Uh, so I'm opening up that chat to see what we're doing. Uh, I have straight hair on the board. Can you tell me from my pictures, A, B, C, D, E, or F, who has straight hair? And it could be more than one person. Maria is out of the gate, the very first that I see. Uh, Atrina Kalani, you recognize Ellie Fanning, and yes, she does have straight hair. Marina says B, maybe D has straight hair. This hair looks pretty straight to me. And Natalia says A, B, D, N, E. Yes, I agree. I think all of those characters could have straight hair there. I see lots of Bs. I see a couple of uh, Ds. What about uh, E? Do we really think he has straight hair? What's going on there? All right, not sure about E. Let's see about curly hair. Who has curly hair? That's right, I see lots of C's for curly hair. Sandra, I see you there. Hello, welcome to our chat today, Inez. Nice to see you in there. 
Rosa says we can have straight and long hair. Marina says it may be curvy, okay, or curly. All right. Jose, you said can see maybe C or E. So we are looking for that curly hair. I see lots of C's. Excellent. So we're definitely looking at lots of C's here. Um, and I do agree that C probably has the curliest hair of all of these on the group. All right. What about a mustache? Who in this uh, set of pictures has a mustache today? All right. So I see uh, Olga, Olenia, lots of E's here. Laura with E's. Javier with an E. Anna says E as well. Uh, Rita, I see you there with an E, lots of E's. All right, I bet our mustache person is that person there with that E, excellent. All right, what about dark hair? Who inside of the pictures here has dark hair? All right, so I see Katriana, yes, we see dark hair. I see uh, Rosa says three, at least three of those people possibly have dark hair, excellent, thank you, Rosa. Alejandro says it could be D and E, great. Ala, you see, I see you that we've got D and E there as well. Rita also says D, excellent. Gloria, I see you've got C, D, and E. That's very nicely done. Uh, Eugenia Tarzova, I see you've got uh, A and E there, excellent. Jessica, very nicely done, excellent. Good work, everyone. All right, so you've got a couple of different people here with dark hair today. All right, so I need a person with a... I apologize, we had somebody trying to come into my room today. Sorry about that, we lost the sound. All right, who is there that has a beard there? Can we tell? All right, we've got E with a beard, excellent. And I see some comments coming in, great. E with a beard, great. All right, bald, what about bald? All right, I see F, lots of Fs, excellent. Yes, Marina there with an F, great. Oh, I see somebody said E could be bald. He does have a hat on, we're not sure. Diane, Max, that's true. Patrick Stewart is not completely bald. Um, let's look here for spiky hair. Who's got spiky hair here? All right, and how can we describe spiky? Can anyone help me describe that? Um, some people might not know spiky. I see spiky, but what does that, what does that mean? Uh, Kristen says it's kind of pointed, great. Ekriana says it like looks sharp, it's great. Patricia is pointy. Lara says it's up, great. Or like grassy, hedgehog hair, I like that, Miraja, hedgehogs, yep. Very sharp, kind of sticky and pointy, great. <clears throat> she had lip, standing up like a hedgehog, that's great. Great descriptions. Or a porcupine, that works too. Uh, what about blondes? Who has blonde hair in our lesson today? All right, B and A definitely seem to be our blondes. What about um, F? Does he have blonde hair? No, he's got gray hair. That is correct. Kind of gray, white. Normally what we call that maybe gray, sometimes, I mean, that's correct. We could call that silver, uh, but that's definitely different from blonde, right? That's a different one. <laughs> Diane, I like your answer there. Uh, let's see, handsome. Who's handsome? Always nice to have a somebody with a good sense of humor on. Uh, handsome. Uh, every is it everybody? It depends. So you can see that could be everybody. Possibly um, AD, right? When uh, I'm going to give us another word. So I've got lots of handsomes. ADE. And yes, that's true. Handsome can be very personal. Um, so for we want to look at this. I see Bulgenia, we have a good point there. Handsome, um, handsome eyes. What about beautiful? Who's beautiful here? All right, the girls are beautiful. And uh, what's the difference? When do we normally use the word handsome and when do we use beautiful? Who would do we usually use the word handsome to describe? Do we know? 
Ah, there's a good question there. Yes, handsome. We normally use some handsome to describe men, and we would use a word like beautiful usually to describe women. So handsome is something we might use for men, and beautiful is often used for, for women or for ladies. I see, and sometimes we might use this for girls. What about our last word in our lesson here, cute? Mm, I see some Bs and some As, could be both. <laughs> Ectrina says Ellie is cute, yes. All right, cute as a button, Diane says. Excellent, very good. Cute as pretty. All right, so when we use cute, we usually use that to describe uh, what type of person, an older person or younger people? Charmaine says younger, yes, that's correct. Generally, when we're using a word like cute, we'll use that to describe our younger people, and we would uh, reserve a words like handsome for someone who's slightly older and sometimes beautiful as well. Um, of course, depending on the context, that might change, but typically we would use the word cute to describe younger people, excellent. All right, great job, class, let's move on. Let's keep those words in mind. Um, I've got some sentences on the board, uh, and I want to make a sentence about number one here. Uh, he's got what? What does number one got? He's got what for number one? He's got glasses, that's true. And can we describe his appearance? He's got dark hair, excellent. He's got dark hair. He's got a spiky hair and a beard, yes. And what do you think? He is what? What do you think? He is handsome, right? So we've got he's got to describe his appearance and he is to, to use one of those other adjectives like handsome or good looking. Yes. Laura says he's very good looking. I like that. Zenya says he's good looking. All right. So what I'd like you to do now is to pick one of those numbers. And if you can write some sentences about a number. So for example, maybe you want to write us two sentences about number eight. Uh, I'd like you to write the complete sentence, please. So if you choose number eight, you might write she's got uh, straight hair or you might write, she is good looking. So I want you to pick a number and if you can type the number and then some sentences in the box and let's take a look at those sentences together. Ektrina is the first out of the gate. He's got spiky dark hair and he is cute, very nicely done. Maria is looking at number two. He's got spiky hair, he's cute. And he is jumping over to number nine. He's cute, he is adorable. He's a very cute kid. Number eight is cute. Number seven, he is bald, yes. 11 is good looking, all right. Uh, Dragia, I, I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name. Uh, I see that was a question, wait. Uh, Magala, she is number 11, she is beautiful, excellent. Uh, let's see, Sandra there, she's got curly hair and she is beautiful, I like that. Sandra, who are you talking about, Sandra Morant? Did you get a number there? I missed that number. Number 12, there we go. Uh, let's see, lots of good sentences here. Excellent work. Now we're doing this in our chat box and I want you to try to imagine in my classroom, my students might be doing this activity as a pair or as a group work. So it's, it's a bit different when we're online like this. Um, in the classroom, I might do this as a pair activity for my students. All right, great work everyone. I can see that we're using those, those words really well. Uh, really quickly, can you tell me, when I have a word like blonde, what is that? Is that um, what something, is that the color or is that more of a description of the appearance like spiky? So what is blonde? Yep, it's a color similar to yellow, that's right. Great. So blonde, that's, that's usually something that we might have as a color, right. Excellent. What about gray? We had gray earlier. Gray is also, <laughs> Anna says it's a state of mind. Nicely, nicely achieved there, Anna. Uh, blonde and gray, those are both colors. Very nicely done. All right. Going to go ahead and move on. We're going to do a little bit of a listening activity. Um, I'm going to read the passage, and I want you to fill in the blank in that chat box and uh, in the question box, and I'll go through and read those answers. So we'll start off at the beginning. This is our new neighbor. She's got blonde curly hair and blue eyes. I think she's beautiful. Her name is, what do we think? All right, see lots of Alice's, Maribella says Alice, Zorna says Alice, excellent. 
Alice, and they're with Alice Sudeshna, and they're with Alice. Great, Jose, I see you there with Alice. Excellent. All right, I think we all agree that it's Alice. Her brother is, he's got short, dark hair and brown eyes. He's good looking. What do you think? Who's the brother? I'm seeing lots of hues. Elisa says hue. Carmen is a hue there. Great. De, uh, Devia says hue. Suda says hue. Excellent job. All right. My best friend's got straight hair and brown eyes. She wears glasses. Her name is, what do we think? <clears throat> Ruby, that's right. We can find that brown hair and dark eyes. Oh, some people are jumping ahead. That's okay. I understand how, how we get excited about the answers. Um, <clears throat> the boy with spiky hair is, I think he's very handsome. Who is that handsome devil? Xenia says Greg. Maria, Yelena says Greg. Gordania says Greg. Excellent. All right. We're in agreement that that is Greg. Excellent job. Is there uh, anything else that we might say about Ruby? What else has Ruby got? She has glasses. Yep. I like those glasses. Easy way to tell who she is. Spectacles, that's a great word there, Marina. She has a nice smile, we can say that. She has a cute smile. She's also got long, straight hair, excellent. What about, uh, one more sentence, what about Greg? Is there anything else we can say about Greg? <laughs> Who is that? Uh, Laura says he's a high, high uh, Dan, Diane, high forehead. He has blonde hair, so we could say his blonde, spiky hair. Yep, fair hair, fair complexion. He's cute, excellent, great job. All right, now we're going to move into a kind of game. Um, this can be a little challenging to play online, so I want you to try to imagine this. Um, I'm going to try to pick one of my students here today, so we'll, we'll see who we can get in here. Um, I want to be student A, so one of the students in the chat is going to be student B. Um, who would like to be my volunteer? Someone type volunteer, and you're going to be my volunteer. All right. Diane Max, I can see you were going for it, so let's do it. Diane, um, I want to know, is it he, she, or they, Diane? All right, Diane says it's a he. Okay, Diane, um, what does he uh, what does he look like? Diane, give us some clues. He's got, he is. All right, he's got a long hair and beard. So what do you think, group? Diane says he's got a long hair and a beard. All right, I see he is a hippie. All right, that's a bigger clue. Kate, Laura, Elena, Sanja, Maria, they're saying number two. Diane, is it number two? Diane says it is number two. Yes, we got that. All right, I want to pick one more volunteer to be our leader for the game. I'm gonna scroll up and see, there was somebody who got in just after Diane. Who was that? Let me see if I can find that name. I apologize, just scroll up through some comments here. Uh, Victoria, Nikshana, can you be my volunteer? Victoria? All right, Victoria, can you tell me he, she, or they? He, she, or they, Victoria? All right, it's a she. Victoria, what does she look like? Can you give us some hints? What has she, she is, she's got? All right, Victoria says she's got straight long hair. Okay, that's a, that could be a couple of people, straight long hair. Uh, any other hints there, Victoria? I see a lot of people are saying her. She's beautiful. I think I agree with the group that's saying number one. Victoria, is it number one? 
All right, excellent. We were correct, it's number one. I, I want you to imagine in a classroom we would do a similar activity. I would like to do this and usually I will do this in pairs and I'll have students pair up together to complete this activity. Now on our chat box it's a bit difficult to do, but I think everyone can imagine what this would look like if I were uh, doing this inside of my classroom. All right, and then we would close up. Unfortunately, it's difficult to do this because you can only really see me and Brian, um, but I would have you look around the classroom and describe a classmate. So maybe if you can tell me what, what have I got, um, we can describe me really quickly. I'm, I'm the classmate you can see. What do you think? Be kind. <laughs> what has Sarah got? Long dark hair. <laughs> Thank you, Marina. I take good care of those eyebrows. Uh, long wavy hair or curly hair. Yeah. Our teacher has long, uh, long wavy hair. Pretty smile. Thank you. All right. So imagine in the classroom, my students are looking around and uh, they can ask those, they can say those different things. And then, of course, this is like an I spy activity uh, where I'm trying to find my different classmates. And then I would have my students take turns describing classmates to partners. Um, so here in my lesson, my end of my lesson is students are going to describe their different classmates, physical appearance, when guided by questions. We've been practicing the questions over and over as we go through our lesson. So as I said in the beginning of the session today, I started off with my goal. What did I want my students to be able to do by the time they finish the lesson? And so here it's describe what somebody looks like. My goal activity is students are going to ask and answer questions about what someone looks like. So now I know my goal and I've pl plugged that into the end of my lesson. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to look at how I can build in my practice. Because the final goal is asking and answering questions, I want to make sure that both of my practice activities, my practice, more practice, all include questions and answers. Now, I know that my vocabulary is the most difficult, so I need to think about how I'm going to scaffold that in. So I began with those pictures to make sure that I could clarify the vocabulary words and the definitions for the different students. In the classroom, I can do this as a point two activity as well, and I might even have my students play with those uh, pictures in pairs. And then I want to start practicing that asking and answering. Now, fortunately, my book had lots of asking and answering question activities that worked with those physical descriptions. And I was able to pick up activity one through five and use that those pictures, the reading and the listening from the student book to help my students practice asking and answering questions. Um, from here, I wanted to do that more practice, but again, this was freer practice, so a little less scaffolding. And here I used activity number seven, which was a game activity. Now, my book also included an activity six, but I did not incorporate this into my lesson plan today because it wasn't a great activity for a webinar. Um, however, in the classroom, I could certainly include activity six or perhaps use that as a homework or a final assessment activity if I wanted to. And then finally, I'm going to get back to my goal activity. I want my students to ask and answer questions about classmates, so I'm changing that just a little bit to make it a bit more descriptive of who they will talk about. And then I have some clarity here. And for this, actually, activity number eight in my book, that gave me some great information that I could use in my classroom. So as you see, as I was going through my lesson, we start off by building that vocabulary and doing that clarification. Again, we're starting off with a lot of scaffolding, clarifying, making sure my students understand everything. And I was asking you questions about everyone to start modeling how we ask and answer questions towards the end. In our he's got, she's got, now we're practicing using our different vocabulary words and sentences. Again, we're asking and answering at first, and then I allowed you to work a little bit more independently by writing those sentences about different people. Um, I could even have students write sentences and then do a pair activity where one person speaks their sentences out loud and their partner has to guess which of the numbers here they're talking about. And so that kind of builds up to our next activity, which is um, our, our neighbor activity where the students will listen and determine who that neighbor is until finally we get into our game activity. And here, I like this little activity. It was in my book, very easy to use. And again, for this activity, I would generally have my students do this two or three times. So once they've done this with a partner one or two times, I'll have my students change and work with another partner. And then I might have my students change and work again with another partner. 
And then finally, we get into that look around the room, that I spy classmate activity, which is, of course, my final goal. So when I'm building for scaffolding the classroom, <clears throat> I do want to think about the various different stages of working with this. What's going to be challenging to my learners and to my students? How I can use that to create observable, achievable objectives and my goal and build all of that together. Observable is very important here. If you think about my last activity, where my students are describing partners, I as a teacher can walk around the classroom and listen to my students using that vocabulary. This tells me that I can observe my goal and it's something my students achieved by the end of class. With that goal in mind, I'm building my other stages of the lesson. And of course, I want to have that logical sequence. So we're constantly working after we've clarified the vocabulary with asking and answering questions consistently all the way through the end of the lesson. And then during that final activity, that's when I'm going to check to make sure that my students have completed our objective to see that we've been successful in the class today. And if I have done my job appropriately, my students are going to be able to drive away and use that English with success in a different context, maybe to describe someone later in the day, um, possibly at home or in other activities throughout the week um, if I'm teaching additional lessons. Of course, I might not want her to drive away uh, so right now, but my goal is to get her ready to do that driving on her own as we work through the lesson. In today's sessions, I did say we had a couple of resources here. Again, I do use the global scale of English sometimes to just check for difficulty so I can understand what is the most complex part of my lesson if I'm not sure. Um, I, again, we can look at both vocabulary, we can look at vocabulary, grammar, and the different skills of reading, listening, speaking, and writing. If you want to know more about this resource, you can get this information at english.com slash GSE, and you will see the correlation between the Common European Framework of Reference. So if you're using the CEFR, you'll find that information, again, at english.com slash GSE. And in the English language learning objectives, you'll see learning objectives and you can see how they can then be used to inform the teaching material that we use in the classroom. Um, for my teaching material today, I pulled most of my content today from Pop Tropica English Islands Level 5, and I do believe that this was the first level of the unit. So if you're currently working with Pop Tropica Islands, um, this might be a lesson that you can bring into the classroom and teach with your own students. And for here, I think we've left just the right amount of time at the end for some questions. So I'm going to open up the chat box and uh, try to dig into questions. And Brian, if you saw something I missed, um, feel free to let me know what that is. Well, I thought there were some interesting comments. Diane said that, uh, for example, you could use the same activity um, uh, using pictures of your students, uh, which, of course, is personalizing the activity, I think, which is uh, a nice thing. Um, uh, and then there were some questions as well, as well about um, time. For example, how long would a lesson like this take or, or mm -hmm. pacing? How long would each activity <clears throat> as well? So depending, um, I like to think about this when I plan with PPP, how much time do I have and how much time will my learners need? Now for this particular lesson, I'm assuming I have about a 50 minute class. Um, when I use that PPP framework, uh, generally my presentation takes about five to eight minutes of my class. Practicing time takes about 20 minutes of my class. Uh, and then I leave anywhere from 20 to 25 minutes at the end of my class for those final game um, fluency activities. So that does mean that my students will do a lot of speaking and listening with partners. And this is where bringing in pictures of other students, um, even I love sometimes to just bring in some local magazines and use that as kind of a final additional activity for fluency. But I really ideally want to have the most amount of time in that production activity. Now, when you use the PPP framework, you can certainly use that even to plan a 25-minute lesson that I'm going to complete in one day. But if I have a shorter class period where I only have 25 or even 30 minutes with my students, I might separate each P onto a different day. So for example, I could do my presentation of my new vocabulary and my vocabulary clarification on Monday in my first 30 minutes. Then I can come back in on Tuesday and work on a lot of practice, review what I presented on Monday, practice some more. And then if my students are returning perhaps on Friday, at that point we'll have a very short review of the presentation and practice from the previous days, and then we'll spend the rest of the class time in production. 
So depending on the amount of time you have in class, um, you can certainly break this up in different ways. But I do like to, to tell teachers, you can break the P's up over different days if you feel that your students will really need to dig in and have more scaffolding. If that vocabulary was really challenging and you feel like you need an entire day, then take a day and just be aware that that's your presentation day. And then you'll need to do practice and production on the, those following days when you're coming back up. Uh, Divyas, how many time, uh, how much time did I spend preparing this lesson? Well, this is a wonderful thing about having a well-constructed book. Um, you'll notice that I pulled most of my practice activities from the book that I was using today. Um, so that actually saved me a lot of time, and it actually freed up my time to think of some other activities. Um, one of my favorite additions to this would, if I have some extra time at the end of the class, is to have my students do an information gap where one student describes a person and the other student has to draw that picture and then they hide it behind their hand and then turn it around and show their friend. It's a quick way to have students use the vocabulary, um, but that's something I had time to come up with because my book really covered a lot of that content for me. Uh, generally, when I'm planning for my classes, I take probably, de uh, depending on how many times I'll teach something, about an hour. So if this is a lesson I'm re repeating with several groups of students, um, I would be sure to plan. I would practice it myself to make sure I'm thinking about my instructional language and my dialogue, um, and then we'll work with that. If it's a one-off lesson, I'm only teaching to one group for one day, then I probably want to spend about 20 minutes planning, and I want to maximize the book as much as possible uh, so that I'm not going to to be doing a lot of constant prep here. So that, that is very important. I do like to think, I like to use what I call an 80-20 model whenever I plan for classes. The, my book should cover 80% of my classroom content, and then 20% is my creative ideas and how I make content relevant to my students. But I really want to make sure I'm getting the best use out of my book because that saves me a lot of time and it honestly helps me get some sleep and relax at night because I can get pretty busy. All right. I think, Katriana, depending on the interest of your students, drawing can always be excellent inside of a lesson. Um, I do like drawing for anything that uses adjectives or describing words. Um, so if you're doing adjectives or working on different types of descriptions, that's a great time to bring in drawing. Um, so that's something that we might want to do in a lesson there. And I'm, I'm Yelani, I'm trying to get up there and read that. I think the question is about uh, when you have uh, m m uh, different levels of students in the in the same class here. How do you scaffold in mixed level classes or mixed ability classes? So I think mixed ability is probably one of the biggest challenges we have as English language teachers right now in the classroom. And generally what I like to do is my do a lot of work within the first uh, couple of weeks of a class to determine what the, the abilities are so that I can use different kinds of groupings with my students. So I may have one, my group, um, let's call my group A, that's working closer to say an A1 level of ability. And then I may have a group B that's working closer to an A2 level of ability. Now, in today's lesson, the most difficult content was in an A2, A2 and I was able to scaffold this lesson so everyone could be successful, um, even my A2 students. And give me one second for some water. <clears throat> Um, if, for example, if let's say that my vocabulary had not been as challenging, I might want to do um, an extra activity for my higher level ability group um, so that they can get a little more practice, like perhaps writing a paragraph or making a recording while group A is still working on the other content. Um, it really does depend on the content and what it is that I need my students to achieve. Um, typically, though, I'll try to rearrange my groups based on ability skills. I know that uh, sometimes in the classroom, I might have students who have good speaking and listening skills, but the same students could actually struggle a lot with their reading and writing, and they might actually be in a different mixed ability group with reading and writing, and that allows me to differentiate a bit more um, a, a bit more carefully and a bit with a bit more precision to the types of skills that my learners are doing. Um, it is a challenging question. I'm, I'm working on some content right now on differentiating content for learning, uh, but it's, it is definitely something that a lot of us as educators are working towards in the classroom. Uh, Davia is a great question. So in my classrooms, I have had um, as few as five students when I was very lucky and as many as 60. 
So um, when you're working with 60, you have a lot of mixed ability going on in your lesson. Um, and at that point, you really are working with group work and you're thinking very carefully about how you can support all of your learners. Um, so I like a lot of pairing. I like group work inside of my classes, not only for the purpose of classroom management, but also for making sure that my students are all getting a chance to work with content at their level of ability. Um, Diane, high-low pairing, it depends on what I'm working with. Um, being conscious of my students, of their interests, of their abilities. Um, some students really don't like to teach others, so I do have to be a bit aware of their personalities and behaviors. Um, and it is something that I do lightly. I try not to constantly do high-low pairing. Um, if I'm doing a skill like writing, for example, a high-low pair could be very useful because my high person can help my person who's at a lower level of ability. But in a speaking activity, the high person may dominate the discussion or choose not to talk at all because the abilities are too different. Um, so really, depending on the skill and depending on what I'm working with, I want to make those decisions on a case-by-case -case basis on what will be the best for them. Okay, I think we've covered quite a few questions. I'm sure there are more questions in there, um, but I don't know if we have a whole lot more time for those. Uh, uh, we probably should be wrapping up a little bit. I know you have a few things to say. Uh, a few extra things to say uh, as well, Sarah, and then we'll kind of move on from there. All right. Uh, so I really want to thank everyone for coming into the session today. I'm going to back up. Um, if some of you were uh, participating today, you may be thinking, I really wish I could have some session notes or a handout for the session that has all of this content. Um, if you're looking for that, their place to go is going to be eltlearningjourneys.com. We will be posting the session notes for the session you had today a little bit later on um, in the next couple of days. So if you want to come back and get those session notes or maybe you want to share this with a friend, um, you're looking for eltlearningjourneys.com. And also, as Brian mentioned at the beginning of our session today, there are additional webinars in this series coming up. We have Michael Branch, who's coming in to talk to you about the four C's. I am a huge fan of the four C's, especially in English language learning. So I hope you uh, come back and check that out. And then we have a follow up with that with games in the primary classroom. Um, I also am a big fan of game based learning. And I think that you'll find the scaffolding session will inform both of these um, as you're coming up through the next couple of days. Uh, so I hope you get a chance to participate and check in on both of those. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Brian. Okay, and we will also be sending you a follow-up email as well. Uh, so we should be sending you a link to the recording, uh, a certificate as well for, for, for having attended the session today. Uh, so there will be some things coming coming your way. Um, once again, I'd like to thank everyone for for attending today. I think uh, it was a, a a very interesting session to 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 look at um, to look at scaffolding today. I think it's something that um, we I think a lot of us do uh, sort of a second nature, uh, but sometimes it's it's good to, to to take a look at it again and 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 to really see how activities work together, um, how you can think about what the the final you know sort of learning objectives of your students are. Um, there's there's a lot to take in today, and I think it was all is all very 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 useful for us. So so thanks thanks once again to Sarah, uh, and thank you uh, all as well out there for coming today. Um, we hope to see you again uh, in the very near future for another free webinar. So thanks for coming. Thanks everyone. Bye bye.